Let's turn together in the Word of God to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew 11, we'll begin reading at verse 28, and we'll read into chapter 12 and through verse 14. We're continuing on in an exposition of the fourth commandment. We've hit the pause button here a little bit and have had a number of sermons on the fourth commandment. I'm doing one this week and, Lord willing, one more next Sunday morning, and then we'll move on to the fifth commandment. Matthew 11, beginning at verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were in hunger and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was in hunger, and they that were with him, how he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests? Or have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, ye would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. And when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days, that they might accuse him? And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. Then saith he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. To that point we read the holy and inspired word of God. On the basis of those passages and many others, we continue on our exposition of the fourth commandment. Following the lead of the Heidelberg Catechism in Lord's Day 38, you'll find Lord's Day 38 in the back of your Psalter, page 22. You're going to know this one by heart by the end of our explaining of Lord's Day 38. What doth God require in the fourth commandment? First, that the ministry of the gospel and the schools be maintained, and that I, especially on the Sabbath, that is, on the day of rest, diligently frequent the church of God to hear his word, to use the sacraments, publicly to call upon the Lord, and to contribute to the relief of the poor as becomes a Christian. Secondly, that all the days of my life I cease from my evil works and yield myself to the Lord to work by his Holy Spirit in me and thus begin in this life the eternal Sabbath. Beloved of God, last time we pulled the curtain back on that word Sabbath 
and that Lord's Day 38 uses to describe the Sunday day of worship in the New Testament. It calls it the Sabbath. In other words, it's saying that the fourth commandment is still in effect. When the fourth commandment says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, that still applies to us. That's still the fourth commandment to us. The Sabbath day has not fallen away with the coming of Jesus Christ. The day has been changed. Christ, the king of the church, changed the day from Saturday to Sunday, like he changed Passover to Lord's Supper, like he changed circumcision to baptism. He changed the Sabbath day from Saturday to Sunday, but it's still the Sabbath day. He did that by rising on Sunday, the first day of the week. And he communicated that change by appearing to his disciples on Sunday repeatedly and communicating to them, this is the day when I meet with you. This is the New Testament Sabbath. Now, sometimes the objection comes to that, and maybe that comes up in your mind. But didn't Jesus in his earthly ministry abolish the Sabbath day? When he went around teaching in the Gospels for those three years, didn't he do away with the Sabbath? He was always arguing with those Pharisees about the Sabbath day. Didn't he undermine the fourth commandment? Didn't he do away with it as he argued with them? Didn't he even say, the Sabbath is made for man and not man for the Sabbath? And didn't he say that as the Lord of the Sabbath? He called himself the Lord of the Sabbath. And he told us the Sabbath is for man. Well, then can't we do with it whatever we want to do with it? Just like we do whatever we want to do on any other day of the week. And look what we read at the beginning of Matthew chapter 12. But when the Pharisees saw it, verse 2, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful on the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, he contradicted what they said was lawful to do on the Sabbath. Isn't he undermining the fourth commandment and saying it's not a law of God anymore? And when this argument is made, then it's kind of presented like this. You people who still honor the fourth commandment as the Sabbath day, and your, your creeds and confessions that talk about Sunday as the Sabbath day, you're really like the Pharisees in the gospel accounts. And we're really like Jesus who abolished the fourth commandment. And when your catechism says, what does God require in the fourth commandment? There really isn't anything that he requires. He's done away with it. And maybe there's some nice traditions like going to church that make some sense, but it's not the law of God anymore. Let's look at Jesus' teaching and his interaction with the Pharisees this morning and understand it under the theme, the Lord of the Sabbath. Well, notice first the meaning of that. Second, the teaching of the Lord of the Sabbath regarding the fourth commandment. And third, the gift that this is to us. The Lord of the Sabbath, the meaning, the teaching, and the gift. If you think about it for just a moment, what the Lord says here in Matthew chapter 12 is an astounding thing. He's making an earth-shattering claim when he says that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. It's no wonder that the Pharisees wanted to kill him. When Jesus said that, I am the Son of Man, and I am Lord even of the Sabbath day. He's saying something that the Pharisees would have been utterly shocked by and would have been terribly, terribly angry about as they were. The occasion for the Lord to make that statement is 
that on the Sabbath day, he was walking through a field of corn, and we learn a little bit later that they were walking, he was walking with his disciples to the synagogue to worship on the Sabbath day. And as they were walking through a field of corn, his disciples plucked some ears of corn off of the stalks there in that field, and they took those ears, and they rubbed them, and the, and the corn kernels fell off, and they ate them as they were walking to the synagogue. Something that was not wrong to do from the point of view of stealing. The laws of gleaning allowed for the poor to glean from the fields. And the Pharisees don't accuse the disciples or the Lord of stealing that corn. That wasn't the issue. The laws of gleaning allowed for it. But the Pharisees accuse something else. And as you read it, it's almost like they're they're jumping out of the corn and saying, aha, aha, look. At this point, the Pharisees are, are watching the Lord so closely, trying to find something that he does or that he says that is against the law of God so that they can convince the people that he's not the Messiah. Because, of course, the Messiah wouldn't teach something that's wrong. And, of course, the Messiah wouldn't do something that's wrong. So if they can catch him teaching something or doing something that's wrong, then they can convince that, look, he's not the Messiah at all. So they sort of jump out of the corn and point to him, look, look, he's doing something wrong right here. It's not lawful to do this on the Sabbath day. That was the issue. It was the Sabbath day. According to the Pharisees' traditions, not now the law of God, but according to the Pharisees' traditions, gleaning was not allowed on the Sabbath day. It was allowed on Monday through the rest of the week, but not on the Sabbath day. And Jesus' ultimate response to this confrontation is that I, the Son of Man, am Lord of the Sabbath day. And how dare you think that you know better than I what God's law is about the Sabbath. It's really an astounding claim of divinity. He calls himself Son of God, and he calls himself Lord. Perhaps you know that that title, sorry, Son of Man and Lord. Perhaps you know that that title, Son of Man, comes from Daniel chapter 7. A prophecy of the Messiah who ascends up into heaven and appears before the Ancient of Days, God Himself. And who shows Himself having all power. God gives Him all power over everything in the kingdom. That title, Son of Man, indicates both His humanity and His divinity. He's Son of Man. He comes from a woman as a human. But because it's coming from Daniel chapter 7, it's also a title of divine power. He's given by the Ancient of Days rule over all things. And then he also calls himself the Lord. The Son of Man is the Lord, even of the Sabbath day. And that word there that he uses for Lord is the word that corresponds to the Old Testament name for God, Adonai, which means absolute sovereign one who rules over all. The psalmist uses both Lord in the sense of Jehovah and Lord in the sense of Adonai, when he says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. O Jehovah, our Adonai, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. It's a name for God. He calls himself, I am the Adonai. And then he adds, and I am sovereign even over the Sabbath day. Now what's he saying when he says that? He's saying, I have power over it. I have the rights over the Sabbath day. I have creator's rights over it. And of course, just like you know, the Pharisees know that the Sabbath began in the creation week. It didn't begin at Mount Sinai when it was written down on the tables of stone, the Israelites themselves obeyed the Sabbath day command long before it was given at Mount Sinai. It began right there in the creation week where God worked for six days and then he rested on the seventh. And Jesus is saying, 
I am Lord of the Sabbath. In other words, I was there. I was creating the world, and I created the Sabbath day. I am the Son of Man of Daniel 7, and I am the Adonai. I am Jehovah Himself. And therefore, I have the rights to say what this law of Jehovah God is and is not. And then you can understand why verse 14 says, the Pharisees went out and held a council together about how they might destroy him. He was claiming to be God. As Lord of the Sabbath, as the one who has authority and creator's rights over it, what does he say about it in his teaching? Here and throughout the gospel accounts. Well, first of all, notice that he never, ever, ever, ever says, I do away with it. I abolish it. He never says that the fourth commandment falls away now. Never does he say, I, as Lord of the Sabbath, decree that now the fourth commandment is sort of just a suggestion. He leaves it standing as the fourth commandment of the law. Jesus speaks about the Sabbath day 11 times in seven different passages in the Gospels. What we read this morning, Mark chapter 2, Luke chapter 6, Luke chapter 13, Luke chapter 14, John 5, and John 7. In every single one of those passages, and the 11 times he speaks about it, he argues with the Pharisees about the proper meaning of the Sabbath day. Not about whether or not there is a Sabbath day. The Lord and the Pharisees had no disagreement about whether or not the fourth commandment still stood. About whether or not there was a Sabbath day to be remembered. But they butted heads on what it meant and how it was to apply to the people of God. In fact, if you read the gospel accounts with this in mind, it's going to strike you how constantly the Lord Jesus is dealing with the Jews' wrong understanding of the Ten Commandments. And he's constantly sorting through and correcting their wrong understanding of the law. If there was anything that the Pharisees and the leaders of the Jews were famous for, it was a wrong understanding of the law, which led to their, led to their wrong understanding of the gospel. And so a large part of Jesus' ministry was correcting their teaching concerning the law. Sometimes they had a wrong understanding of the law because they took things away from it that had to be there. And they made its requirement a lot less than it actually was. And other times they had added all kinds of their own things to that law and put all kinds of man-made requirements upon it and made it say much more than what God actually intended that it say. When I was in seminary, in the summers I worked for a company that flipped houses. They took older houses and fixed them up and then sold them for a profit. The owner of that company was always on the lookout for houses that had wood floors. At that time, if you could have a house that you resold with wood floors, you'd make a greater profit. Maybe it's still that way. I don't know. But when he found a house that had wood floors, it was always that that wood floor was in one of two conditions. Either that wood floor was all beat up and chipped up and there were pieces of wood flooring missing or chunks of it out. And so in order to bring that wood floor back to its original condition, there had to be pieces added to it and stain and varnish added to it. That was one condition of the wood floors in the houses that we always found. The others had wood floors that were covered in, in carpet. There was a time there, I think it was in the 70s, when carpet was so popular and they covered even the wood floors with carpet. 
and sometimes two or three layers of carpet over that wood floor. And so in order, in those cases, to get back to the original wood floor, you had to peel back these layers of carpet to get to what was underneath. And those are the two things Jesus is constantly doing in his interacting with the Pharisees regarding the law. To get back to the original beauty of God's law, either he has to add something to it that they had stripped away to get it back to its original condition, or he has to strip off layers of man-made rules that they've added on top of it in order to get it back to its original condition. But either way, when it came to the law, the Ten Commandments, he never destroyed the wood floor. He was always getting back to the wood floor and magnifying that word floor, the, the true meaning of that law. Let me give you one example of where he had to add pieces to it. The seventh commandment in marriage. In Jesus' day, the Jews were way, way, way loose regarding marriage and regarding divorce and remarriage. There was a whole school, almost like a denomination, with a rabbi at the head of that called Hillel who taught marriage this way. He said, you could divorce your wife for just about anything. If she burnt your toast in the morning, you, you could get rid of her. And that sounds funny, is it? but that's really an example he gave. If she burns your meal, you can do away with her. And there was another school of thought following a man named Shammai, who was a little bit, not quite that loose, but still very loose. And Jesus comes into that situation in Matthew 19 and says, what? From the beginning it was not so. Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. And the disciples are standing there aghast at it. They think it's too strict. He's at, he has to add, replace wood flooring in order to bring the law back to its original beauty and the beauty of marriage and what God created in marriage. But you see, with the fourth commandment, with the Sabbath day, it's the opposite. Here he has to rip up carpet. This is a case where the Pharisees had added all kinds of man-made rules and laws to the law of God that they said were the law of God. And Jesus, in his interactions with the Pharisees, is stripping up these layers of carpet to get back to the original wood flooring, to the original law. He's not destroying the fourth commandment. He's getting back to what it is. The Pharisees took the prohibition of the fourth commandment. In it, thou shalt not do any work. And they said, what does that mean? In it, thou shalt not do any work. And eventually, they came up with over 1,000 rules of what it meant to work and not to work on the Sabbath day. And maybe it started out innocently enough, you could imagine, how it could. We have these questions, right, sometimes? Somebody comes back from the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and there's a, a bush that they planted in front of their house, and it has a, a dead limb on it. Well, if, if I cut this off before I go inside, is that work? Did I labor on the Sabbath day? And so they go ask the rabbi, and, and they talk it over, and... And eventually, over 1,000 rules they made to try to cover every situation that could possibly come up to say what's work and what isn't work. And picking corn on the Sabbath day, gleaning on the Sabbath day, was one of those 1,000, over 1,000 list of rules that the Pharisees had. You could glean on the other days of the week, but you can't glean on this day. Not, mind you, just you can't harvest corn and go sell it but you can't glean. The poor people can't glean on the Sabbath day because that's work. They had a rule about carrying your bed mat on the Sabbath day. That was one of these over a thousand rules, and the Lord pokes at that in Matthew 9, verse 6. 
They said that was work, not you can't do that on the Sabbath day. They said you can only walk a certain amount of steps in succession on the Sabbath day. And they played it out and tried to figure it out. How many steps can you walk before you, you really feel like you're, you're laboring here in your walking, before you start to sweat? And they tried to determine and said, this is the amount. You can walk this many steps in succession, and after that, you're, you're sweating, you're laboring. When you see in the Bible where it says, a Sabbath day's journey, that's what this is talking about. This was the, what the Pharisees said. You can go this far on the Sabbath day. And they had all of these, over a thousand of these things. They had another one concerning eggs that you don't find in the scriptures, but you find in the books that they wrote that come down to us. They said, if you raised chickens and you wanted to eat an egg on the Sabbath day, it was work for you if you went and got an egg and you made an egg. But if you didn't raise chickens and there happened to be a chicken that laid an egg on your property and you went and ate it, that wasn't work. That was one of the over 1,000 on the list. So that you see, the whole point of the Sabbath was lost under this mess. How could the people keep the Sabbath in the way that it was supposed to be kept? The positive, the entering into the rest of the Sabbath day. They were weighed down by this. They're just walking around thinking, am I working? Am I not working? And constantly. And the Lord is pulling up this carpet in his interaction with the Pharisees and saying, we need to get back to what this law actually is all about. He's not destroying the fourth commandment. He's not destroying the Sabbath day. He's stripping away the layers of carpet. And in Matthew 12, verse 2, when they say it's not lawful, for them to eat corn. He's not going against the actual law of God. He's going against their 1,000 list of rules. And he's saying, no, this is not what the law is. Get back to the original law of Jehovah God, which is don't labor. Put away your regular work. Put away your entertainments on this day and enter in to the rest that's been reserved for you on this day. That's the Lord's concern. Remember he said in Matthew 5 verse 17, think not that I'm come to destroy the law, talking about the Ten Commandments that he's explaining in the Sermon on the Mount. I am come not to destroy, but to fulfill. And he says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. How can he be the Lord of the Sabbath if there is no Sabbath anymore to be Lord over? And later, and this is the clincher, he says in Matthew chapter 24, at the end of his ministry, speaking about the future times just before his second coming again, he says this, but pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day, for then shall be great tribulation. He's assuming that there is a Sabbath day in the future that lasts through the whole New Testament period all the way until his second coming. He didn't turn it into a suggestion. It still stands as the fourth commandment, the law of God, the Sabbath. Jesus in his teaching, in his earthly ministry, explicitly supported all ten of the Ten Commandments, including this fourth one. Why would he spend so much time correcting the Jews' misunderstanding of the fourth commandment if it was just going to fall away in a couple of weeks anyway. And if it was to fall away, he would have just said it's going to fall away. He had no qualms about saying that regarding Old Testament things that did fall away. What did he say to the Samaritan woman at the well? The day is coming and now is when you're not going to worship in the temple anymore. Old Testament worship is going to fall away. He would have said that about the Sabbath day if that was the case, but he didn't. And as Lord of the Sabbath, he says, this command is still in effect, but I'm not going to abide the Pharisees' corruption of it and their attempts to usurp the Lord of the Sabbath's rule over his own law. And I'm going to teach what it really is 
and what it really means. And so you see, in the process of stripping back the carpet, all those layers of all those rules that they have made, the Lord Jesus makes clear in his teaching that when the fourth commandment says, in it thou shalt not do any work, it's simple. It's quite simple. Don't do your regular work. And in fact, there are three kinds of activity and work that you may do on the Sabbath day. First, acts of worship. That's work. It's work for the priests in the temple. It's work for the people who come. And that kind of work is not forbidden when it says, in it thou shalt not do any work. In fact, that's the main point of the Sabbath day. It's so that you can enter into these pious works of worship. Second, the Lord taught acts of necessity that sustain life and allow a person, therefore, to enter into the reality of the rest of the Lord's day are not forbidden when it says, in it thou shalt not do any work. And third, acts of mercy that sustain life and allow people to enter into the rest of the Sabbath day are not forbidden. And all three of those are taught in the passage that we read this morning. Let's take them in the order of the passage itself. First of all, acts of necessity, getting food to eat, picking corn in a field for their personal sustenance was not work that was forbidden on this day. They needed it to do the spiritual work of entering into the synagogue and worship and hearing the word of God and understanding and entering into the rest. Harvesting grain to sell at the market, that's a whole other thing. But eating was an act of necessity. That is not labor forbidden by the fourth commandment. We may cook on this day and have food for ourselves. Snow plows have to go out during the winter so that people can get out. If somebody works at a power plant, probably has to take his turn as a shift. An act of necessity, so that there could be electricity, so that there can be heat in the winter, so that there can be cool in the heat of the summer, so that people may enter into the rest of this day. The question should be asked with acts of necessity, is this reasonably necessary for us to enter into the rest that is provided for us on this day. If the kids want cereal on Sunday morning and you forgot to buy a gallon of milk on Saturday, that's probably not an act of necessity to go and get the gallon of milk on Sunday morning. They can eat eggs. But there's other things that are acts of necessity. Second, acts of mercy may be performed on this day. That's verses 9 through 14. There's a man with a withered hand in the synagogue and the Pharisees, again, trying to catch Jesus, point out this man to him. Look, he has a withered hand. What do you think? You want to heal him? We wouldn't allow it. We don't allow it. Are you going to do it? We're watching you. And Jesus first points out to them the foolishness of all of their lists of a thousand rules about work on this day by pointing out to them that according to their own rules, it's not wrong for them to get a sheep or an oxen out of a pit or ditch on the Sabbath day. That was one of theirs, one of their rules. Because it padded their pocketbook, they allowed that you can get your sheep out of a pit. And Jesus points out to them, is not a man worth more than a sheep? As Jesus shows that they're all their list of their man-made rules is folly and is man-centered and doesn't have anything to do with love for God and love for the neighbor. And so before the whole congregation, he heals this man's withered hand. 
And he states the principle in verse 12. Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath day. What better day to do good? Visit the sick. Visit the elderly. Bring a meal. This is why in the Reformed tradition, doctors and nurses and firemen and policemen are not violating the Sabbath day by doing what they need to do on the Sabbath day for the protection and the healing of others. Of course, a surgeon shouldn't schedule a tonsillectomy for Sunday. It could easily be done on on Monday or on Tuesday. But an emergency surgery to protect life may require him to leave church when the beeper goes or to be at the hospital when the services are going on. The genuine act of mercy. And then third, not only works of necessity and works of mercy, but primarily works of worship. In it thou shalt not do any work. Does not mean you may say, well, it's work. It's hard to enter into worship. And so therefore, I'm not going to go to church. This is work worthy of the day. In fact, this is what the day was created for. To come apart and to worship. Matthew 12, verses 5 and 6. Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath day the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in in this place is one greater than the temple. The priests are working in the temple on the Sabbath day for the sake of worship. They're offering more sacrifices on the Sabbath day than they were the other days. They're leading the people in singing. They're teaching people the word of God. Also that God's people can enter into the true rest that is reserved for them on this day. And the Lord Jesus is saying, That's not breaking the law. They're blameless. Because this is what the Sabbath is for. It's for worship. And even though it requires work to worship, this is what it's for. He taught that in his own life. Luke 4, verse 16, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. It was his custom every Sabbath day to go to church. Don't forget that in Matthew 12, when he heals the man with a withered hand, he's doing it at church. He went to the synagogue, and that man happened to be there. That's quite striking if you think about it. Jesus could do miracles. For the four hours, or whatever it was, that he was in church on the Sabbath day, he could have been walking around the countryside healing how many people? Hundreds of people could have gotten healed. But he used this day to go to church. He used this day for worship because that was the primary point of it. If you deliberately schedule your acts of mercy during the worship service in order to get out of the worship services, don't think that you can ease your conscience by the teaching of Jesus here. The worship was the main thing. With this teaching, you see then, can't you, that Jesus is upholding the fourth commandment and he's bringing it back to be what it's supposed to be, a blessing to the people of God. As Lord of the Sabbath, it is the case that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. But that doesn't mean that you could do whatever you want on the Sabbath. That means as it was created as a law of God, it is a gift and is to be received as a gift. That this is a good thing that God grants. And he knows our foolishness so that he made it a law, so that we can't mess with it, but so that we use it because we need it. Maybe some of you will go visit a national park this summer. Or maybe you have in the past. If you go to a national park, There are rules 
but there are thou shalt nots. You can't walk anywhere you want in that national park. You have to stay on this certain path. You can't cross over the rope that's there. Why is that? It's because this park is a beautiful piece of land, so beautiful that it's been set apart from all the other pieces of land in the nation. And in order for people to enter into it and use it and receive the, the beauty that comes from it, it has to be protected. That's what the Sabbath commandments are. The negatives of the Sabbath commandment are so that this beautiful thing may be protected so that we might use it. Thou shalt not labor on this day. Thou shalt not enter into thy own entertainments on my holy day, says Jehovah God. Why are there negatives? Thou shalt not. It's so that this, this beautiful Sabbath day, this park where we enter in to the rest that God has reserved for us, may be used. The negative is in service of the positive. You see, you have to begin reading where we began reading at the end of Matthew 11. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And then right after that, he goes and he starts stripping up the carpet regarding the Sabbath day. Why? So that they may come on the Sabbath day and find rest. The rest of him, who he is, his gospel, that takes the burden of sin upon himself and bears it away upon his cross and that sets forth his teaching as the way of life of gratitude and a way of life that will be good for you as God commands it. All of that was being lost. Don't work. Put away your regular entertainments so that you can take this beautiful park that's been preserved for you and use it and enter into it. Yes, you're going to have to make some rules for your children. We're not going to do this on this day. We're not going to do that on this day. But teach them why. Because we're preserving this park for the beautiful, beautiful means of rest that it is. There is a Sabbath that remains for the people of God. Hebrews 4 says, a command, a requirement, a law. Let's not destroy the wood floor by taking away from it or by adding to it. But receive it as God gives it as a command and as a gift. Amen. Father in heaven, bless thy word to our hearing and strengthen us in faith, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.